Good morning. It's Wednesday, July 29th, 2015. This is Tech Talk Today, episode 198, and my name is Chris. And oh my gosh, breaking news, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, that's right. It's Windows 10 Day. Windows 10 went public today. We are uh, festive here on the Tech Talk Today show, and we'll be doing a little coverage to celebrate the event. And to help me break it all down on this July 29th, 2015, is our Mumble Room. Time of Probe's greeting, Mumble Room. Hello. 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 Hi, guys. So uh, who who here has Windows 10 at least downloaded? Uh, say I. Come on, at least one of you does. It... Uh, I got it in the VM. Okay, Sean. Yeah, uh, William, do you have it downloaded? Be honest. Don't lie. It's working. Okay, it's in, it's in process. It's in process. All right, so we got. It's interesting c- because it just went to 100 percent and then came back to 19 percent with this little thing that just says progress and then a percentage. <laughs> so I have no clue what it's even doing. So I, can, I assume maybe it downloaded the content. and Now it's writing, but it's it, actually it's not writing because the disk has a light on it. So, so this is I a traditional know. Microsoft progress bar, is what you're telling me. Windows 10, the yeah, tradition. Yeah, it's going back and forth. Yes, I don't know. Uh, so yeah, it's available in 190 countries today, uh, and uh, there you go. Re- the reviews are coming in, and most of them are pretty positive. Just uh, from the from the uh, cliff notes here, the Ars Technica says. Windows 10 is the best version yet once the bugs get fixed. Oh, that's so funny. It's going to be, it's great uh, once they fix it. Uh, of course, uh, over at uh, ZDNet, Mary Jo Foley says, Windows 10 is much better than Windows 8.1, but the OS still lacks some functionality and apps. Best wait for more features to be expected in the fall, she says. Uh, the Verge, Windows 10 review, a great fix to the problems of Windows 8 and the new start menu, Cortana and more, but bugs linger and the Edge browser lacks extensions. But my friends, what really matters is what the average people see, the, those that are known as the Windows users of the world. And by the, for that perspective, while we have to turn to mainstream media, at ABC News at 4 a.m. covers the breaking news. In tech world today, Microsoft's newest operating system, Windows 10, now available. Yeah, excitement is quite a fever pitch, but ABC's tech contributor, Tina Trin, shows us the new advancements that should make Apple users a little jealous. Hey Howard, Windows 10 is here. Windows 10, free upgrade. Hey, did you know Windows 10 is coming? Anybody? Anybody? Okay, so it's not earth shattering news, but there are still plenty of cool things you can do with the latest version of Windows. Take Cortana, for instance. It's a digital assistant that comes built in. It can add reminders and appointments to your calendar, search the web, even write an email for you. Now watch her actual use case of Cortana here. Now, I I, I don't want to be Mr. Naysayer on Windows Day, but uh, I just, I don't see a lot of people doing this. All you have to do is ask it to. Hey, Cortana. Waiting, waiting. Send an email to Sandra. What's your email about? Brunch. And of course, if she was typing it, the email would be done at this point. With Windows 10, what's old is new again. Like Now, there's a slogan you can guarantee they didn't rip off from Apple. So many people will accuse Microsoft of ripping off from Apple, but I'm, gonna, I'm telling you, they're not. that's not one thing they've ripped With off Windows from Apple. With Windows 10, what's old is new again. What's old is new again, everybody. Like the start menu. It's back in the lower left-hand corner, but this time with live tiles that have at-a-glance info. We want it to be familiar and fresh. And distracting. So the steering wheel is just where you expect it to be. The stick shift is just where you want it to be. Whether you're coming from seven or eight, you should have no problem learning the system very quickly. Now that is, I think, the most telling messaging about the Windows 10 launch is uh, that this is a slogan. This, uh, the steering wheel and the pedals are where you expect them to be. If anybody's done IT support, you've heard users say, I don't know why they keep moving the pedal on me in the steering wheel. This is Microsoft very intentionally getting this message out there. And it's clever and it's so revealing of what they're trying to accomplish with Windows 10. And in a way, it's kind of sad. That have at a glance info. We want it to be familiar and fresh. So the steering wheel is just where you expect it to be. The stick shift is just where you want it to be. Whether you're coming- we will never take risks again. We're sorry we tried something bold. We're so sorry. Come back to us. From seven or eight, you should have no problem learning the system very quickly. Especially when you can simply write instead of type or touch. Now here's another thing. First of all, nobody really is going to do this except for a few small business use cases. And second of all, they don't mention anywhere in this report that you have to have a touch screen and a pen to be able to do this. They just make it sound like if you get Windows 10, you get this feature. That's what the new web browser called Edge lets users do with web pages. Because it supports the latest web standards and it even allows you to mark up the web, you can actually ink on a website directly. You can ink, guys. To make the web work the way you do. And when it comes time to get work done, but you only have your phone, no problem. 
we have something called Continuum for Phone, where the phone in your pocket can finally be used in productivity scenarios. So you can imagine taking your phone and docking it to a keyboard and mouse and having a very PC-like experience. So I'm, I'm sorry, what was that, Mark Shuttleworth? With Continuum, whatever screen is in your hand is always the appropriate screen for the task at hand. Even if that task is gaming. With Windows 10, gamers can now stream Xbox games directly from the console onto any PC in the house. So while it might not be headline news, Windows 10 is still worth checking out. Tina Trin, ABC News, New York. So there you go. There's the mainstream coverage of the Windows 10 launch. And uh, Mumble Remote, your impressions. Are you sold? Are you going to go out and get it right now? Actually, it's free. So why not? This is interesting. I downloaded the installer for 64-bit, and it's telling me I need to use it on a 64-bit system or something, mm -hmm. even though it is. It, it, uh, Actually, I take that back. It's telling me I need the 64-bit media because I just like tried to click on the setup thing within my current OS. But to you downloaded it just to see the 64-bit ISO. I clicked on the 64-bit option in their little <laughs> installer uh, GUI thing. Hey, oh, well, um, I mean, those you know those kinds of things are gonna happen. Yeah. We'll I, see. yeah. Um, <clears throat> so there's a couple of things I do want to talk about Windows 10. So there's obviously you just heard some new features like Cortana and things that are built in. Well, in order to power all of this, there's a whole new set of privacy policies. And here's kind of a cute thing that Microsoft is doing that you should probably be aware of. Uh, Windows 10 is going on uh, is going public today, July 29th. You are agreeing to a privacy policy that is current as of July 29th. This new privacy policy automatically goes in effect in August. So you're you not actually so you are you be by by agreeing to the privacy policy that is in Windows 10 today you are preemptively agreeing to the privacy policy they're about to roll out which is much more egregious than the one that ships in Windows 10 today and um, I actually have a really great breakdown of it here let me see if this site actually came back yet no they're getting slammed right now so as you might expect uh, I, I caught this I was up early this morning and I caught this before it got a lot of attention and now their site is getting completely slammed but. Uh, the next web has a pretty decent uh, rewrite of it, so I'll cover the highlights with you. Uh, so, Windows 10, when you when you have an online account, uh, by default will sync a lot of key data in your account, uh, your browser history, your bookmarks, also your Wi-Fi networks and the passwords to those Wi-Fi networks will now be stored at Microsoft. Uh, and also, if you use uh, any micro uh, encryption, the encryption key will be stored in your OneDrive account. Now, that's particularly relevant if law enforcement were to come to Microsoft with a warrant. Microsoft would have your decryption key stored in your OneDrive. That that they would be able to retrieve. Now, Cortana, uh, consider her a sexy spy machine. Uh, here's what it says in Microsoft's privacy policy. To enable Cortana to provide personalized experiences and relevant suggestions, Microsoft collects and uses various types of data, such as your device location, data from your calendar, the apps you use, data from your emails and your text messages, who you call, your contacts, and how often you interact with them on your device. Cortana also learns about you by collecting data about how you use your device, other Microsoft services, your music, your alarm settings, whether the lock screen is on, whether you view and purchase apps, your browse and Bing search history, and more. So also, in order to enable Cortana, they also have to be always listening and collecting various voice data samples, they say. Um, that's interesting. It kind of makes sense. Cortana's not magic. She has to be able to do that and be able to read all of those things. Here's the other thing. Whatever happens, Microsoft knows what you're doing. The updated terms also state that Microsoft will collect information from you and your devices, including, for example, app use data for apps that run on Windows and data about the networks you connect to. Here's the particularly egregious part. Windows 10 will generate a unique advertising ID for each user on each device that can only be used by developers and ad networks to profile you. And it's a unique ID that follows you amongst your devices. They know who you are and they know what device you're on. And advertisers have access to this. And so they know which account it is and they can track it across all, all the Microsoft devices. That's, pretty, that's a pretty significant tracking thing. Windows. So when you log into Windows 10 and you sign up for these sync services in the background at that time, it's automatically generating that advertising tracking ID that's built into the operating system. A tracking ID built into the operating system. Okay. And I think it's also particularly egregious the way they're doing the OneDrive uh, backup of your encryption key. In my opinion, I think by default the option should be that key is lost. And let's get users knowing that encryption means serious business. It's the way Apple's doing it. Let's just say if you lose this key, you, you lost your data. And then have a checkbox. 
instead back it up to OneDrive. And then you back it up to OneDrive and you a screen comes up and says, this will now be on a public service that is available to law enforcement. Whatever kind of screen you could put up there would be really, it would be really more informational. So make it secure by default. Make it secure by default. And then a checkbox to make it less secure, to make it vulnerable. That would be my preference. And this whole thing, you know, same with the advertising. You can go in there and you can opt out of the advertising ID, but you can opt out, right? Uh, no, that's not the right approach. Make this operating system for the end users. So make it, I have to opt in if I want that for some reason. If it's for the, if you're building this desktop operating system for the users, I would be opting into it, not having to opt out of it. And then, of course, Microsoft can disclose your data when it feels like it. This is, according to the next web, the part that they're most concerned with. Microsoft's new privacy policy assigns a very loose, uh, assigns very loose when it comes to a when it will not access and disclose your personal data. And this is from the policy here. <clears throat> We will access and disclose and preserve your personal data, including your content, such as the content of your emails and other private communications or files in private folders. When we have good faith or belief that doing so is necessary to protect our customers or enforce the terms governing the use of the services. So essentially what they're saying, I like it. I like that they just come, in a way, come out and say, they don't say we might, they say we will access we will access, disclose, and preserve personal data, including your content. I mean, they just say it. I mean, that's nice. That's a pretty good, I mean, that's, at least they're clear about that. So this is the new privacy policy that comes in. Uh, the next web has a, a link to it. I also have a link to the original source if they uh, manage to get their site back up. I'm trying to see if the next web has the date for when. Yeah, here we go. So the new policy, I love it. The new policy takes effect on August 1st. So that's going to be on Saturday. So everybody's downloading Windows 10 today. They're getting the old privacy policy. Then Bob's your uncle, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> new privacy policy kicks in. Pretty nice. Very convenient. Yeah, I mean, at least they tell you what they're doing, right? That's good. And, uh, you know, putting that stuff in the EULA... Man, that is genius. If we could go back to like the 1980s to like the Computer Chronicles and tell like Stuart Chaffe the kind of things that they can stuff in a EULA these days, they had they laugh. They, no, nobody takes those things. Oh, they do. We do. We're still doing it. Uh, so anyways, and you know, uh, it's a good week uh, for Windows 10 to come out too because apparently tablet market shares not doing so well. Not that the PC market is doing so great either, but the iPad market share has fallen below 25% in tablets. These are the latest numbers from IDC's worldwide quarterly tablet trackers that show that Apple remains the largest vendor in the declining tablet market overall, shipping 10.9 million iPads in the second quarter of 2015. While the iPad continues to be the best-selling tablet, its worldwide market share both fell below 25% as Apple has faced increased competition from low-cost rivals such as Lenovo, Huawei, and LG. So Apple's at number one, and then Samsung, then Lenovo, then Huawei, and then LG Electronics. Now, I would make a prediction, and one of the reasons I decided to cover this in the show right now, is I think this is probably going to turn around starting in the fall and a year from now quite a bit. I think they're probably, I think, yeah, I think what it is is the iPads and the tablets are just have a much, much, much longer refresh cycle than the phones. And the tablets, you, get, you can do a lot more for a lot longer, and you can hand them down and fit to family members and friends, and it's it's much, much, much different story than a phone. And uh, there's not as many compelling reasons to update a tablet. Don't you think, guys, or do you think tablets were just a flash in the pan? I think they serve a purpose, but it's not going to be like a heavy computing purpose for most power users. Maybe, like, if you're on the couch and you're watching a show, you want to check, like, a social media. Yeah. It might be good, but, like, I could see it using that uh, using a tablet for that, but I can't see for like I want a mobile game or no, I I just can't do that. It doesn't feel that good to me. Yeah, JB Hockatru says the tablet software turned out not to be as productive than we thought it would be. And the OS needs to change, and that is actually one of the big changes in iOS nine. Uh, is they're you know doing all that all that uh, multitasking side by side window stuff, and that's big. That's a big thing in in uh, in Windows. 10, so with their Metro UI and stuff. I don't know. We'll see. I suspect it's it's one part that you don't need a monstrous box to do what tablets are being used for, and I think another part it's the OSs haven't been compelling enough and the apps haven't been productive enough, and I think another part is, is people are spending their money on other things. But I think tablets, I think that, I think these numbers are about to switch around. I I bet in a year from now their things are going pick them back up. Yeah, I'm a con chairman says the multitasking iPad will probably increase iPad demand. We'll see. I mean, you got to have something to multitask. <laughs> you got to use them. What are you going to use? Uh, we'll see. Yeah, maybe, and maybe, you know, maybe actually a multitasking might, it might help the iPad in, in the enterprise. That could be something I could see there. 
All right. Well, so that brings us to the end of our Windows 10 day. Boy, exciting. Oh, man. Super exciting. Uh, we'll be back tomorrow. Uh, two more episodes this week, Thursday and Friday, jblive.tv, 9 a.m., noon Eastern. Go to jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar to get that to your local time zone, techtalktoday.reddit.com to contribute to the show. And if all goes as planned, and should be joining me on Friday's edition of the Tech Talk program. Now, I, at the end of the show here, instead of doing an end of show video clip, I wanted to play an NPR report about teleportation. This is, we kind of had a cool emerging science story at the end of last week's episode. So uh, this, is a, this is a couple of minute clip, a few minutes, and it is about a real life transporter. So us Star Trek fans, something to be really excited about. So I want to play this for you, and uh, well, this will be our end of show clip. I'll see you back here tomorrow. Don't forget that subreddit. I appreciate it. And, of course, our Mumble Room. Thank you guys for being here, and I'd invite you to join us. You get that just by hitting bang Mumble Room in our chat room embedded over at jblive.tv. Thanks for joining me today. See you back here tomorrow. Happy Scientists Day. Scientists have been working on teleportation, you know, beaming matter from one place to another, the way the crew of the Starship Enterprise descends to the surface of mysterious planets in Star Trek. Enterprise. Transporter room energized. It's almost like some superpower for superheroes. And it's also real science, sort of. Here's NPR's Jeff Brumfield. So first off, I know true nerd listeners don't consider Captain Kirk a superhero, but close. And speaking of close... I have a hard time saying this is a straight face, but I will. You can teleport a single atom from one place to another. Chris Monroe is a physicist at the University of Maryland. Teleporting just one atom isn't exactly beam me up, but his team really can do it. That's not a teleporter. It's an elevator. They do it in the basement. In this lab sits a couple million dollars worth of lasers, mirrors, and lenses. And David Huckle. We've actually made quite a bit of improvements in teleporting. We could now teleport over a distance of about three feet. It's taken years just to get this far. Now, the way they do it here is not like Star Trek. What they do in in a TV show is they send the atoms over a long distance. But really, if, if you could sort of build anything, you wouldn't send the atoms. Because the atoms are big and heavy, and you don't really need them. The laws of physics say that any atom of carbon is identical to any other atom of carbon. Oxygen, hydrogen, they're all perfect atomic clones. The thing that makes us unique is the states of those atoms. So you'd really send the information, the state of the atom. The information is in the arrangement of the atom's electrons or protons or neutrons. That's what makes it special. And researchers have figured out how to move that information without moving the atoms themselves. In a tiny steel chamber, they trap one single atom of the element barium. On the other side, there's a a nearly identical setup. And uh, there's a single atom actually trapped right now in the middle of that chamber. And when the team sends the command, lasers suck the information out of atom A and scan it into atom B. From the perspective of physics, it's the same as moving atom A across the table. Teleportation. But here's where reality clashes with the superpower. Imagine you built a human-sized version of this technology. To teleport, you need about a billion, billion, billion atoms waiting at your destination that could be arranged into you. And remember, the information isn't copied, it's moved. So all the atoms that used to be you at the start, Chris Monroe says they'd be left behind in a gunky mess. Iron and, yeah, carbons and calcium, and yeah, it would look like a big pile of jello, I guess. On the receiving end, there could be errors. An error probably wouldn't be like your arm is gone. That's sort of a very correlated error. It would be something much more disgusting, maybe. (laughs) All joking aside, this kind of teleportation would never work for people. There's just no way that we know to read out all the information in a billion, billion, billion atoms, transport it, and put it back together again somewhere else. We don't have a language to describe what a person is, what all the interactions between all the molecules that make up a person, how to keep track of them. I mean, we don't have machinery. And we probably never will. That's not to say this kind of one-atom teleportation is useless. Monroe thinks it could help to build advanced computers. But for now, big-time teleportation will stay on the big screen. Jeff Brumfield, NPR News. 